Thank you. If any um, ultra-depressed hippies have strayed in here or environmentalists, I mean, I welcome you and uh, congratulate you on your courage after <coughs> looking at those posters. Um, I am... Um, <laughs> Uh, <clears throat> my friend P.J. O'Rourke uh, is also a second thoughter, like myself, was a radical in the 60s. And uh, P.J. has said that um, God is a Republican, <laughs> Santa Claus is a Democrat. <laughs> and God is a uh, hard taskmaster. He uh, helps those who help themselves. When you get out in the get up in the morning and look out at the world and see the world divided into rich and poor and black and white and male and female and at each other's throats and all that suffering going on, you realize it's not paradise. <coughs> God reminds you uh, why your primal parents were expelled from paradise because of their nature, because of your nature because <clears throat> human beings are full of pride and hate because they want to know good and evil, just like God. Um, Santa Claus knows if you've been bad or good, but he doesn't really care. He uh, showers you with presents, and if you didn't work those extra hours to get something, you can always hope that Santa Claus will bring it to you anyway. In every way, Santa Claus is better than God, but one, Santa Claus doesn't exist. What, what is the consequence of believing in something and acting on it that, that like Santa Claus, doesn't exist? Because Santa Claus is obviously not just a stand-in for for Democrats. You know, they never tell you, nobody's ever, how much Santa uh, pays those elves, or whether he pays them at all, or where he gets the wealth, uh, where he gets the, the means to produce that wealth, or how he does it. And uh, if you look at radicals the world over, I mean, the one thing they never talk about is how to produce wealth. All they know is to divide it up and to make everybody poorer in the process. They know how to take, but they don't know how to create. You will never look at it. You will never find in a radical book a prescription for the creation of wealth or a, even an argument uh, to deal uh, with the theorists of, of capitalism uh, on incentives and uh, importance of initiative and so forth. Uh, Frederick Hayek, whom I hope you're all either familiar with or will be before you graduate, who is, I, I think, the greatest social thinker of this century, um, has pay, and, he, he, and is not unknown. He won the Nobel Prize in 1974 and has written pages and pages and books on the importance of the market for initiative and so forth. Is, you, you will never find him mentioned in a, in a radical book. Anyway, what is the price that we pay? What's the cost for believing in something like Santa Claus or socialism that doesn't exist? Well, in 1917 in the Soviet Union, which was then in, in Russia and then called and now, uh, amazingly enough, still called St. Petersburg, uh, or recalled St. Petersburg, a group of um, compassionate do-gooders seized power in uh, in, uh, in this Russian capital. And they had a plan which sounded very good indeed because the radical vision, the Santa Claus vision, is very, very seductive. They are, they are the, in, in some ways, the best ideas. They sound very Christian. They sound very Jewish. They sound just wonderful. And that is that there shouldn't be rich and poor. There shouldn't be suffering. We should take the wealth and divide it up equally. Everybody should get a fair share, uh, which will be an equal share. And uh, it's hard to say that the Russian people actually believed in this. I mean, it was 
I mean, these people really seized power. Uh, but a, an awful lot of people did. There were millions of people all over the world and in, the so in the, what became the Soviet Union who supported the Bolsheviks. And the price they paid was to lose all of their freedom, every <coughs> drop of freedom that they may have had even under the czars, and then to lose their lives, 70 million. If you take the whole Soviet bloc, including China, maybe 100 million people were killed. 100 million people were killed <clears throat> in peacetime by the government to bring them into line with a wonderful plan. And they wound up much poorer than they were before. Tens of millions were put in prison. But even the ones who weren't put in prison wound up poorer. Today in the Soviet Union, well, today in the Soviet Union is facing starvation. That's what's going on in the Soviet Union. But in these last few years, the average intake of meat per citizen in the Soviet Union was less than it was in 1913 under the Tsar. It is, it's in, uh, almost unfathomable, if you haven't been there, how poor those countries are and how they have been robbed of a whole century. I think Solzhenitsyn said that. Just robbed of the 20th century. When I was in Poland in 1989, you go into a store, and not only would there be nothing on the shelves, but you know, if there was anything to buy, um, it was the shopkeeper would write you, handwrite on a piece of paper, your bill after calculating it on an abacus. And Poland was a very developed culture, as, as you can also see. I mean, the Jagiellonian University there was built in the, I think, in the 14th century. This was, this was what communism meant for Poland. In, uh, in the United States in the 60s, a whole generation of new leftists like myself, uh, spearheaded by people like myself who were the children of American communists, um, envisaged, envisaged a, uh, the coming of the age of Aquarius it would be a whole era of Santa Clauses, and we would have freedoms undreamt of by anybody. One of these was um, sexual freedom. When you're 20 years old and, uh, you know, away from home, uh, it could sound really good. You would have sex with no consequences with as many people as you could possibly manage it with, and as many times. Um, there was a terrible price, and that price is still being paid for this delusion. Uh, if people suggested that maybe, well, of course, if anybody said it was immoral, I mean, those were just, you know, people from the dark ages, unenlightened, and kind of had the, uh, uh, message of, of reason and right thinking brought to them. Uh, some people actually thought it might be unsanitary to, you know, just jump into bed or maybe not bed. Some people did it on stages, actually, <laughs> and in the streets. And um, um, In fact, that was a rev revolutionary slogan for one Detroit group. Uh, Sex, drugs, and you know, screwing in the streets, that was their slogan. Um, but if you suggested that it was unsanitary, they would have, you know, just, you're just listening to your parents and your parents don't know anything. Don't trust anyone over 30 is what we said. And um, in the uh, homosexual community, <clears throat> which was developing its own liberation movement, Sexual liberation, paradise on earth is basically what it is, and this is what the left is about. <clears throat> the left is very unhappy with the notion that there might be an angel with a flaming sword standing at the gates of Eden and keeping mortals like us out, uh, or that the only path to a paradise would be following uh, heavenly commandments following the law, and then hoping that by grace, by some divine grace, you could get back, given who you are in your very being. Radical, the whole radical impulse is a rejection of that view, and the view that by reason 
uh, we can reach the kingdom of heaven. And the gay liberation movement, which was launched in 1969, very much believed that paradise was uh, as much sex as you could have with as many people as you could have. Um, and particularly without, of course, without women. And um, I remember a, a gay reporter for the San Francisco Chronicle when Peter and I, Peter Collier and I did one of the first articles on AIDS in San Francisco. And he was explaining to me, he said, David, if you want to understand gay sex, it is sex without, <coughs> boys without girls. Because women are obviously, for anybody who's reached a certain age and encountered had a relationship with a woman. Um, women are a straining element on men because women are child bearers and women also, to bring it sort of down to the level where it unfortunately it needs to be brought, are subject to uh, all kinds of infections and diseases much more than men from um, promiscuous sex with strangers. In the 70s, there was in the gay community, in the liberated community, where men were having between 200 and 2,000 average sexual relationships a year with strangers, different strangers. There was one epidemic after another. And I interviewed a, an official from the Center for Disease Control. And I, I said to him, there, there were a lot of epidemics, weren't there, in the 70s before AIDS? Oh, yes, he said. Uh, we had one big epidemic after another. And since I know how bureaucrats talk, I said to him, how do you guys define a big epidemic? Oh, he said, that's one that costs the taxpayer, the taxpayers a million dollars a day. I said, you had a whole series of epidemics that were costing taxpayers a million dollars a day? He said, yes. And then I thought of an interview that I had had with, uh, with an AIDS patient who said to me, oh, he said, you know, in the 70s, I used to get the clap every week and I would just go in and get my shots. And I said, isn't it the case that if you uh, take an antibiotic, it causes uh, whatever it is, that bacteria, whatever cr is creating the disease, it can cause it to mutate and you can get worse and worse forms of the disease. And he said, that's quite right. He said, I can remember sitting in my offices. And this was a very big figure at the Center for Disease Control. I can remember sitting in my offices thinking to myself, what's out there next? I just wonder what's out there next, what terror. I said, why didn't you guys do something? I mean, here were these bathhouses all over the country. Here were their bathhouses is the euphemism. Their sex palaces where men would go and there would be hundreds of men and you could have, I mean, even the logistics of sleeping with a thousand people a year is, you know, quite significant <laughs> if you have to. <laughs> just, you know, snaring them, as it were, even if they're just, you know, boys without girls. <coughs> Why didn't you guys do something? There were no warnings in the bathhouses. In, the, when these, uh, in fact, this article that we did, it's in this book, Deconstructing the Left, um, the article we did do. Um, th th we did this article at a time when 300,000 men were going to descend on San, San Francisco for a gay liberation parade. And there was not a warning in any of these bathhouses to tell these kids coming from the Midwest <coughs> and wherever that they were, their lives were in danger. Why didn't you guys do something, I said. Because when I was a kid, there was a polio epidemic. And they shut all of the swimming pools. You couldn't go to a swimming pool in the summer. They will just close them down so that you wouldn't catch polio, because that's where a lot of kids would congregate. And you didn't go to the theaters because of that. There are ways to fight epidemics, traditional ways. I said, why didn't you guys do something? And he said, 
because it would be interfering with an alternative lifestyle, and we didn't want to infringe their civil rights. That hundred, what is it now, 125,000 people are now dead. A million and a half are infected. And it's just, it, we are nowhere near the middle of this epidemic because people believed in Santa Claus. They believed they could have sexual liberation as defined by the left to mean paradise on earth as defined by the left. I could go through the 60s. We could just be here all day talking about uh, these liberations of the 60s. Another one was we were going to expand your mind with drugs. Our parents had said and the government said that drugs were dangerous. They made you, we used to, drug addicts used to be called dope fiends, dope fiends. Like homeless people used to be called bums. And <clears throat> children born out of wedlock used to be called illegitimate and bastards. All these were stigmas that served a very important social function, however unjust they may have seemed, that we liberated everybody from in the 60s, we compassionate leftists. And the message was very seductive, just the way it, you know, I, I don't know how seductive it remains today, but very seductive. You know, um, well, marijuana doesn't, you know, it's like alcohol. I mean, I still hear people saying this, cocaine, alcohol. Um, but anyway, we said you could expand. In fact, I remember a leftist saying to me, um, this is the editor, I don't know if you people have ever heard of Tikkun magazine, but it's a leftist magazine in California. It's a national, national circulation. Said to me, I, I'll never forget this, we were walking down the main street of Berkeley, and he said, David, he said, you can't understand socialism until you've dropped acid. <laughs> <laughs> so we were going to expand people's consciousness and so forth. And as a result, we created a market in the middle class. And um, a lot of criminals appeared to supply the market. And a huge industry was created. And now I don't know how many lives have been lost to drugs, how many destroyed, whether people aren't actually dead. This is just another price that one pays for a, for believing in something, for, in an illusion that doesn't exist. And this is, this is really my whole critique of uh, Marxism, <coughs> radical feminism, radical env environmentalism, it's all based on illusions about who we are as human beings and what is possible. You know, flying sounds really great. Wouldn't it be wonderful to be able to sort of flap your arms and fly? But you know, the left to me is like, just it's a group of people, uh, I don't know what to call them. I can't call them idealistic anymore because too many people have, have died from their remedies and they don't change and it just doesn't affect them. But it would be as though they were encouraging people or on top of some you know, cliff to jump off a cliff. And if they just flapped their arms right, they would just soar into, into the blue yonder. Um, I've just become too impressed by the bodies dropping at the bottom of that cliff. Where, where do these ideas go back to that, that divide us today? Because we are really in a country now deeply divided as between right and left. There, there's hardly a center anymore. We are, we are in the midst of a, a profound culture war. <coughs> it goes back to the 18th century and to the original leftist, Rousseau. And um, Jean-Jacques Rousseau, in a memorable phrase, just summed up the view of, of humanity that the left has, and that is that man is born free but is everywhere in chains. And what he meant by that was that <clears throat> by nature, by nature, we, we, we were born to, uh, to be in paradise. By nature, we are sociable. By nature, we're equal. Uh, by nature, we're free. 
that evil is socially caused, or as they would say in English departments and on American uh, university campuses these days, socially constructed, or in women's studies programs. Evil is socially constructed. Everything that you find wrong with the world, the division of people into rich and poor, into strong and weak, into uh, warring communities, uh, is socially caused. The uh, arch, well now he's a cardinal of, of Los Angeles, made a statement uh, maybe a year or two ago, but it's very typical of what a lot of uh, church leaders and certainly all of Hollywood and uh, lots of Democratic politicians are saying, you say, how can, um, how can this be a just society if there are poor and homeless people? And my answer is, why not? I mean, why is it unjust that some people are poor? Maybe that's justice for them. It sounds harsh, maybe, to say. But is it, I mean, you all uh, have peers in your lives whom you grew up with, who went off the deep end somewhere or, or other. Not everybody gets an A in class. Not everybody is productive, not everybody is energetic. Some people are smarter than other people. Of course there's inequality. That's who we are. In any case, if you look at Rousseau's, I'll come back to that in a, in a bit, but if you look at Rousseau's statement, man is born free, but is everywhere in chains. You can see that it's obviously one of the falsest things that anybody has ever said. Are children free? Babies, when a baby is born, is that baby free? Baby is totally dependent, totally dependent on other people, on its parents. It's dependent for getting food. It, it would kill itself very quickly. I mean, if you just left it alone, it would die. It's not free at all. And as, as a child grows, if you've been around children or if you remember yourself, I mean, they're total narcissists selfish, greedy, mine, mine, mine. All I want to be is a center of attention and have whatever they want whenever they want it. That, I mean, that is the voice that responds to the radical, that, that's the radical chant. I want what I want and I want it now. And don't tell me about the costs. It is civilization that makes people free. It is the discipline of civilized order that makes you free. And lo and behold, in the 18th century, just 10 years before, a government was formed on this continent based on that principle. James Madison, just he put it as succinctly as Rousseau, if men were angels, there would be no need for government. It is because of our nature that we need a government and we need restraint. And the American founders were not blind to the fact that society was divided, that uh, post-lapsarian man, that people after the fall in the gar uh, from, the, from grace in the Garden of Eden were divided among each other into classes, into races, into all kinds of factions, social factions. And I, again, this is another work I hope you're familiar with, which is Federalist 10, which is the seed of our constitutional order. And Madison said, he understood that factions, that this division of people, the fact that they don't agree with each other on anything, is a source of danger to a democracy. Because in a democracy, the government rules by consent of the governed. And so if you get a, co a majority coalition, a majority faction can crush and eliminate the minorities. And so our system of government is designed to protect minorities against the majority. 
to reserve certain rights to them that cannot be taken away. Because in the views of our founders, they were God-given. Although not in the views of our democratic senators, apparently, since Clarence Thomas was almost rejected for believing in natural law doctrine that our founders believed in. What Madison said was that we can either do one of two things. We can either attempt to control, to, to eliminate factions, or we can control the effects of factions. And our whole notion of government and, um, and, and democracy is built on the view that we must control the effects of factions. But the left is built on the view that you can eliminate factions. Madison said, it would be impractical, he said, to eliminate factions. He was a very decent human being and did not envisage the modern left. Um, he said, because if people are free, because they're so different, because you are different from, I mean, there are short people and there are tall people, and strong people and weak people, and smart people and not so smart people. And there are people who were born, who see the world from this and point of view and that point of view, and so forth and so on. He said, if you have freedom, you're going to have people disagreeing. So the only way to eliminate factions is to make people think the same way. And he said that was impractical. But of course, that is the agenda of the left. Everybody should think the same way. That's what political correctness is about. That's what speech codes are about. That's what sensitivity is about, that everybody will think the way <coughs> the majority in power thinks. And I understand that you are about to get your own set of um, codes here that will tell you what is insensitive and uh, what you mustn't think. The left, in the end, has to stamp out independent thought. Uh, should all, I'm sure you're all familiar with 1984, but if you aren't, you should read Orwell's 1984 because that is the end case of every leftist program. Now I want to take this to something that affects <clears throat> us all, what I think is the central, the central problem of our society. When, I mean, I, it's obviously the central problem of our society, which is race. When I, um, and, and we, we, we have had, we, our country was built on an original sin <coughs> in uh, slavery. And we paid a terrible, terrible price for the compromises that were made in the constitutional founding in the Civil War, when hundreds of thousands of young American lives were lost in the most brutal manner imaginable um, to purge this land with blood. And of course, it wasn't, a, uh, it wasn't completed in the Civil War. We had a quarter of our citizens denied their constitutional rights and, uh, and privileges in the, in the segregated South and through segregationist laws until 1964 and 1965. And I, um, I supported Martin Luther King and I did uh, infinitesimal, played my infinitesimal part in the civil rights struggle and I am as proud of that today as I was then. Um, but Martin Luther King led a conservative revolution. Martin Luther King was not a Rousseauian. Martin Luther King was very much in the tradition of Madison and the American founders. You've all heard Martin Luther King's famous dream, which he gave at the um, Washington Monument on that day in 1963, I, I have a dream speech. That dream is the American dream, that's what it is. That everybody will be judged by the content of their character and not the color of their skin. For Martin Luther King and the, and the Civil Rights Revolution as it once was, the idea was that we are all uh, equal in the eyes of God and in the eyes of our American state as individuals in a phrase that we used to say in the 50s and 60s, regardless of race, color, or creed. 
the left has destroyed the legacy of Martin Luther King, first betrayed it and has pretty well destroyed it in this country. What goes under the name of the civil rights leadership and establishment is a counter-revolution against the King, the doctrine of King and Madison and Abraham Lincoln and the founding fathers. We now have in this country a whole a panoply of race-specific laws. We have had an effort over the last 20 years to drum into the heads of the American people that they should believe that certain designated oppressed minorities should be privileged by their race and by their skin color. Hispanics, blacks, Aleutian Islanders, not Asian Americans because they seem to do very well in school without uh, help. Um, to me, this is what the most, one of the most bitter ironies of what's happened in the last 30 years. What are the consequences of this? Well, one consequence that for me is very, very poignant. It may, it may seem like ancient history to you. I realize most of you weren't born at this time, but I remember it very vividly. In 1965, the Voting Rights Act was signed and that completed the Constitutional Covenant. It allowed all Americans to have an equal right to vote, to be equal before the law. We had eliminated uh, the racist legacy of this country. And uh, President Johnson wanted to do something else for, the, for, the, for black Americans. He, he, wanted, he, he wanted to address the powers of the federal government um, to helping those who had fallen behind because of racist laws. And he wanted to know what the problem, why black Americans were earning so much less uh, than white Americans. What was the problem of them uh, being, being fully included socially as well as politically? And he gave the task for writing this report to Daniel Patrick Moynihan, who is the uh, Democratic Senator from the state of New York today. And uh, I'm, I'm gonna read you, this is about three sentences, but they are the most prophetic sentences that uh, have been written in my lifetime. Everything that he said would happen has happened. And it all, <clears throat> or an awful lot of it could have been prevented. Uh, and it was, the reason that he was disregarded and attacked, as I will tell you in a moment, was by people who believed in, in Santa Claus and uh, refused to see that the problem, the problem with society is us. We are the problem. The human beings that make it up, it's not society that's the problem. Moynihan said, the one unmistakable lesson in American history is that a country, a community that allows a large number of young men to grow up in broken families, dominated by women, never acquiring any stable relationship to male authority, never acquiring any rational set of expectations about the future. That community asks for and gets chaos. Crime, violence, unrest, disorder, most particularly the furious, unrestrained lashing out at the whole social structure. That is not only to be expected, it is very near to inevitable. Moynihan was an Irish American and he had looked at the Irish American community. He was not saying, this was not theory. He had looked at the actual experience of the Irish American community and he had seen that where there was this breakdown of families, there was, crime, violence, and so forth. When Moynihan's report, and, and, and when he looked at the black community, and let me just make this very clear, because this is not a legacy of slavery. The American black family was intact as late as 1940 in the 50s. 90% of black American children were born into families with two parents. When Moynihan came out with his report, he was denounced by the left as a racist. They said he was blaming the victim. It was politically incorrect, incorrect, to say 
that the behavioral some pattern in the black community was responsible for their problem in getting onto the American ladder of opportunity. And so effective was the leftist attack that the problem of the black community was not discussed for 25 years at the national level and nothing was done to address it. And the result is that now 65% of black children are born out of wedlock. If you know how expensive it is to bring up a child, if any, I mean, you're all too young to have, or many of you are too young to have brought them up, but uh, there is probably nothing more difficult than bringing up kids and getting them on the right path. It takes enormous amounts of energies. It is very expensive. I, I don't know what the percentage is, but the, the, the major explanation, the major causal factor in the poverty of blacks in the inner cities is the breakdown of the black family. I, if this room were full of leftists, I would be, people would be saying I was a racist for saying that, but that is God's truth. The, the black middle class has done very well since the 60s. E even as of 1970, if you were a black family with two parents, and had a high school education complete, you earned as much or as more than the average white family. This is the price. I, the worst thing, in my view, that ever happened post-slavery, uh, or in my lifetime, let me put it that way. The worst thing that has happened in my lifetime to um, uh, black people in America is, is the left and its doctrines. If you wanted to cripple and destroy a community that was struggling to survive, what would you tell them? You would tell them, the society is rigged against you. There's no opportunity for you because you're black. Everybody hates you. Um, go ask the government for money. And actually, the left did that. <clears throat> There was an organization formed in the 60s called the National right, uh, Welfare Rights Organization that actually went out to recruit people to the welfare roles. And in the midst of an economic boom, the welfare roles in this country tripled. And people, people were just brought into a new, new kind of plantation where they became dependent, just morally and uh, in every way, incapable of seeking a job. I mean, has it ever occurred to anybody why? I mean, all the shops in the ghetto are run by Koreans who hardly speak English. Can you imagine what it must be like to come from a, a, an alien culture, hardly speaking English, bring your whole family, I don't know if you've seen any of the stories, read any of the stories, you've seen the TV, the way they run those stores, they run them like 18 hours a day and the whole family works. Expose your children and your family to the violence of the ghetto, what that takes, what determination that takes to lift yourself up by your bootstraps out. What, why, what, why doesn't the black community do that? Where, where are all the blacks? I don't want to hear there's no capital. There's plenty of capital. It's because, and I have spent a lot of time doing stories in the ghetto. That's because their entire vision of these people is present-oriented in a way that nobody in this room could understand. Um, I, I can remember I was standing out in a uh, kind of a dirt lot in the middle of Compton, one of the most violent regions of Los Angeles. It was like a war zone. And um, I was talking <coughs> to a, a group of Crips, it's black, it's a black street gang. And um, their, the father of these kids had, uh, the three kids that <coughs> I was talking to, had worked all his life in the shipyards there. And um, one of the sons, who was actually my protection at the time, named Yogi, a huge guy, who had three children, um, but they were living with the mother on welfare. 
And Yogi had lost his job at the shipyards that his father got him, which was a $12 an hour job because uh, he was on PCP and he destroyed one of the ship's cabins. Had got, and it was very sad. I mean, he, he felt he was 23 years old and felt his life was over. It probably was. And uh, his brother, Ranger, who owned a new Cadillac with wire wheels and everything, he said, um, we were, he said, um, I got, he says, oh, I got me $2,000, he said. I'm going to get me a house. So I said, Ranger, you can buy, you can, $2,000 down, you can get a house. And Yogi went like that, and he said, he said, David, he said an ounce. He says, you people are innocent, so innocent. You know, an ounce of cocaine, that's what he was going to get. I mean, that paycheck never, ever went into a bank account, never was saved, never, and so forth. Um, when I said before about liberalism, I mean, I, as, a, as a radical, I, I had expected to find a center in American life where there were people who called themselves liberals and who believed in classical liberal values, in fairness and in individualism and in equal equality before the law in due process. And... Uh, those people hardly exist anymore in this country, and if they do exist, they're called conservatives. The, um, <laughs> I, the Clarence Thomas hearings, what, what, to me, were kind of quintessential in, in illuminating this problem I've been talking about. What, why do liberals, or people who call themselves liberals, that is, people on the left, why do they hate Clarence Thomas? Why did they hate him from the start? I mean hate. After all, there were two conservatives who came up before Thomas. There was uh, Kennedy and Souter. And they sort of just kind of went through. I mean, everybody knows the game. You, you, have to you have to not commit yourself to anything, and then you can get on the court and be a conservative. That's the way the liberals want to play it. Um, and they played it. But suddenly, with Clarence Thomas, I mean, there was this uh, an unbelievable campaign to destroy the man. I mean, first it was he had these, uh, you know, un-American thoughts about natural law. I mean, I, I couldn't believe it when I saw this natural law campaign come out. Then they went after his uh, divorce papers to, to try to prove that he beat his first wife, which he didn't do. Why do they hate Clarence Thomas? Then they dragged this woman uh, from Oklahoma, and what was, she go what was the idea? The idea was that she was going to accuse this man of something that would destroy his entire career, and she was going to do it from the shadows without ever coming forward. I, can you think of anything more un-American? I mean, I can't. Due process, that's what this country is built on, the right to confront your accuser, the right to cross-examine your accuser. If somebody is going to destroy you, they have to be prepared to come forward and open themselves to the kind of scrutiny that would establish, through due process, that you deserve to be destroyed. That's, you, uh, there's nothing more basic to, uh, to American life than that. And yet these liberals were organizing this campaign, this witch hunt, this incredible smear campaign. Why? That's very simple. They hated Clarence Thomas. They hate Clarence Thomas because he showed that America works. This wonderful set of ideas that was dreamed up by dead white European males and slave owners. Our founders were just that. There wasn't a Jew among them. There wasn't a black among them. There wasn't a female among them. And for the left, that's enough. That shows they must have been wrong about everything. In fact, it's just one of the miracles that you know one has to stand back in awe of and try to understand. It is a paradox that these 
this system, which has worked better than any other for 200 years, in fact, unlike any other in the history of the world, so much so that there's a billion people in the world that want to be like us, although they may not be able to get there. That when, when the Chinese students had their uh, rebellion, even though they had been cut off from the world for 40 years by this horrible police state, the symbol for them of their liberation was the goddess of democracy, very clearly an American goddess. Clarence Thomas, in his life, showed that America worked. He was born on a dirt floor shack in Pinpoint, Georgia, in the midst of the segregationist, racist South. Now, if some radical had got hold of Clarence Thomas when he was a kid, they would have said to him, you are poor, you are black, this country is racist, you haven't got a chance, join the Black Panther Party, join whatever it is, and start screaming at the government to give you a handout. And Clarence Thomas would have been crippled for life. Instead, he had a conservative grandfather who said to him, you know, pay no mind, roll up your sleeves, look to yourself for what you can do, don't whine, be the best that you can be. And he rose to the top of American society by following that path. So, of course, liberals hate Clarence Thomas. America is a racist society. I, I, when I, I want to throw up on anybody I hear say that whenever they say that. <laughs> yes, we have racists in America. i tell you something else. Every single human being on this continent and on any other has racist thoughts at one time or another, racist impulses always whether they're based on fear or ignorance or what, or just plain human orneriness. Just the way we all have unkind thoughts towards somebody or some group. And not that infrequently when you think of it. What we have in this country, however, and that is our fallen nature, if you will. That is why we do not live in Eden. And we cannot get back to Eden, except by subduing those impulses, controlling them, ordering them, civilizing them, uh, whatever. What we have in this country is a system, or had, until the, the left started mucking with our laws and the very notion of civil rights. And they have suborned our president into signing this terrible civil wrongs bill, which institutionalizes the notion uh, that if we don't have in any given institution or group a uh, proportional representation of, of everybody, it's somehow racist. I hope all the leftists on this campus are getting out their petitions to make sure that the Cleveland Cavaliers hire a power Asian forward for their team <laughs> so that it's representative of this country. You'll notice that when you have affirmative action hiring, it somehow stops at the astrophysics department and the hard sciences. That should show you what a crock the whole business is. Anyway, we have a system of, in this country whereby everybody is equal in the eyes of God and before the law. We are judged as individuals without regard to race, color, or creed, and not as groups. The notion that we should have group rights and group privileges is the notion that they are just attempting to get rid of in South Africa. The left's agenda in this country is to turn America into an apartheid state. Is America now? So we, we are all racist in that sense that I, I said before. But this is not a racist country, and I will tell you why I think it is not. In the first place, we have had the greatest civil rights revolution in the history of the world in the last 25 years, and it was supported by the majority of Americans. 
And in fact, it was supported more by the Republican Party in those days uh, in the votes on the important bills like, uh, like the Voting Rights Act than by Democrats. That's neither here nor there. We have the leader of our armed forces is a black man who before he was leader of our armed forces, we entrusted our entire national security to as the president's national security advisor. We do not live in an aristocratic culture as they do in England. We do not have a royal family. But people need icons, they need leaders, they need heroes. In our country, the cultural heroes are entertainers and athletes. When you are a child, those are the people you know and idolize. In our country, the model family for all Americans is a black family, the Cosby family. The number one earning movie star is Eddie Murphy. The number one TV earning star is Bill Cosby. The number one talk show host is Oprah Winfrey. The number one pop uh, music star is Michael Jackson. The number one earning athlete is Michael Jordan. Let me give you a, just a little, and when people say, oh, they're only athletes, only athletes. <clears throat> Let me give you an example. I remember when Sweetwater Clifton was the first black man to be taken into the NBA, the National Basketball Association. You don't have to understand basketball to understand this example. In the mid-70s, when the National Basketball Association was gonna become 51% black, People were saying, especially liberals, that if the NBA becomes 51% black, whites won't go to the games. The NBA is now at least 80% black, and 80% of the paying customers are white. I'll go beyond that. Because people, you know, they have every way of dismissing the obvious. I, I had a, a radical mentor named Isaac Deutscher, and the one thing that he, that he taught me that, is, that still is true <laughs> was that you know, people have a hard time understanding that two and two equals four. The obvious. People will say, oh, it's, it's an entertainment. Well, you know, it's like, uh, I don't know, gladiators in the arena or something, throwing Christians to the lions, whatever. Well, it really isn't. And I will give you this example that sh shows to me what this country is really about. In four years ago, there was a championship played in Portland between the Portland Trailblazers and the Detroit Pistons. Now, Por Oregon doesn't have a large, it has a, almost no black people, just the nature of the state. So 95%, minimum, of the people in the Portland arena, we're white. It was on TV, those of you who do watch basketball would have saw it, maybe remember. So there was 50 or 60,000 people, white people, and taken from all walks of life, not specially educated one way or another, not specially enlightened one way or another. And they came, uh, paid a lot of money to see this game in which nine of the guys out of ten, there were ten, ten ball players on the court, nine were black. And the guy that all these white people came to boo was the white guy. His name was Bill Lambeer. <laughs> Those who know, know who Bill Lambeer is. Bill Lambeer, he's about, <coughs> he is six foot eleven and he plays, because he plays center and forward for the Pistons. And he's a heavy, that's the role he plays. On every team there is what's known as an intimidator. And his job is to be mean and nasty. And uh, you know, to be hated. So that he will intimidate the opposition. Isaiah Thomas is also on the Pistons and he is black. And everybody loves Isaiah because he's a very lovable individual. And that's just the point. Bill Lambeer was not seen as a white guy and Isaiah Thomas was not seen as a black guy. They were seen in their individuality, in the roles that they chose to represent themselves in that game. And I submit that there is no, you cannot get in a, in society, in a society 
of ornery human beings, ordinary and ornery human beings. That is, that is the highest you can get. That's the most you can expect to be seen as it, for, in your individuality, to be seen through all these externalities. That doesn't mean, and when we say a colorblind society, which was the ideal in Martin Luther King's day, it doesn't mean that the color is washed away. Isaiah Thomas will always be black. I will always be Jewish. Bill Lambier will always be white. He'll be big, I'll be small. That's just the way it is. Some people are pretty, some people are not so pretty. What you ask for is that instead of people fixing you in that and identifying you with a group and dismissing you that way, that they see you in your individuality. And that's what we had in this country and that is what we are losing today. That is what we are losing by people who want to define things that persons of color and uh, females and, I mean, in this Thomas hearing, the idea that the feminists raised, that if there had been 12 females, on the, or is it eight, or whatever there are on the Judiciary Committee, that they would have believed Anita Hill. Nonsense. What is that saying for women, that they can't judge the facts in the case, that they'll just vote with the women and the men will just vote with the men? I mean, if we believe that, then, you know, it's just the war of all against all. And the strongest and the most numerous will just crush everybody else. We are in the midst in this country of a culture war. In this coming year, I mean, you've already seen a lot of it, there's going to be a, there's a lot of arguments about Columbus. These have nothing to do with Christopher Columbus and whatever he did or didn't do 500 years ago. The idea is that what the war is about is about America. It's about what happened on this continent, about whether it is the greatest and noblest experiment ever conducted by human beings, on which, in my humble estimation, the future of the world does depend or whether it's some kind of genocidal nightmare that stamped out some paradise, as for example, when the Aztecs who plucked out the hearts of young virgins to sacrifice them for their gods and enslaved each other, and anyway. Um, but that's what it's about. It's about the nature of this country. And this country is different from all other nations in the world because a Frenchman is a Frenchman. You cannot become French if you are not French. America is the only country where you come into the country and you can actually become an American, whether you're black, yellow, brown, and so forth. And how do you become an American? You become an American by buying into this social contract, this constitutional covenant, by believing in individual rights, by believing that we are all equal before the law, we all have a right to dignity, and respect, tolerance. The idea of America is at stake here. Arthur Schlesinger has written a book called Disuniting America about multiculturalism. And the, the multicultural movement on the campus is uh, mainly among professors, I think. Um, like the political correctness movement, is a radical movement and it is aimed at destroying the idea, the very idea of American nationhood. In your lifetime, you're going to fight this battle. And I hope that for you, as for me, the slogan of your battle will be one nation, one culture, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Well, right now we'll do a question and answer period for anybody who has any questions. You can ask uh, Mr. Horowitz and we'll be obliged to answer. Aside from the 125,000 dead, that's a big problem. <laughs> I, I mean, is this a serious, 
I, I don't get the gist of your question. I mean, I, I could tell you that um, promiscuity doesn't work, but then we'd be here for another two hours discussing that. People are saying that the diseases can be cured someday. I'm not sure there are other problems. Well, I don't know that that's true. Who says that? I was told in 1983 that they might never get a cure for AIDS. You know there has never been a cure for polio. And polio is only a virus. AIDS is a retrovirus. So I don't know who's telling you that there's going to be a cure, but there may never be a cure. Well, and I, I kind of want to limit the discussion to that. I, I, you know. I guess I'm just asking you to explain um, problems that happen in a family structure as a result of the casual love that has happened. Yeah, well, I think that's true. I mean, there's been a tremendous decline in the, in the number of intact child-rearing families, but that's also be not just because of that, but there's a direct assault on the family by radical uh, homosexuals. And I, I want to say, I, I, I think that conservatives are often uh, cross the line over intolerance in dealing with people who are homosexual. In my view, and this is, this is just my view, in my view, homosexuality is uh, genetic. And I say that because I I've thought a lot about it, and uh, it's inconceivable to me that so many people could choose to be homosexual in the midst of a, uh, an epidemic like AIDS. And so once, w once I come to that conclusion, then I, my, my attitude is one of uh, tolerance and respect for others and for people who are different. But I, I'm at war with the agenda, which wants to make uh, homosexual relationships, for example, equal to child-rearing families, which is a direct assault on the family, which wants to change all of our public health uh, rules uh, in fighting AIDS. And it, it, to me, it is, again, it's an example of how incredibly tolerant America is, because the radical activists in the homosexual community have uh, persuaded first liberals and then they, they've taken into camp the entire apparatus, the entire public health apparatus. It's the first epidemic that we do not fight the way we fight all other epidemics. And I would, I mean, tell you, just, just on one issue alone, this thing of uh, somebody was telling me at, at UVA, they, I don't know, do you have condom dispensers in the school? I mean, this, um, the, the willingness to invade the private lives of children in our school systems to encourage promiscuity through the, you know, to just walk into people's private lives. I mean, everybody makes their own choices in this and dispense, mass dispense condoms, which is brought into, you know, across the board, rather than, for example, how about testing people? What, what is the danger of getting AIDS on this campus? You don't know. You don't know how many people have AIDS, maybe no one. What's the danger of getting AIDS in Ashland? Just the community. Don't know. Here's an epidemic. We're in, we're in the tenth or eleventh year of an epidemic that's killed 125,000 people. That's taking billions. I mean, more money, ten times as much money for AIDS research as for um, breast and ovarian cancer, which kills ten times as many people. Uh, the health budget is, I mean, states are going bankrupt in their health budgets. You have no idea. It costs $100,000 per AIDS patient. Multiply that by hundreds of thousands of people uh, with AIDS. It's 230,000 now in the United States, and you'll get an idea of the magnitude of the problem. And we don't know where the disease is, and we don't know who's threatened, because there's no testing. Or if there, there's testing, if, you know, an individual should happen to want to wander in. Can you believe that? I don't know what the system is now, but when I got married, you had to go in for a, you had to take a syphilis test. It's just something you had to do. Why are we testing people? Politics. It's politically incorrect to test them. And if you, I mean, the, uh, the left says invasion of privacy. Ho, ho, ho. An invasion of privacy. Like going into the public schools in New York without the consent of the parents and giving everybody condoms. That's not an invasion of, of privacy. Or like outing people, which, which uh, the, the radicals do, and there's no protest over that. 
disclosing people's uh, homosexuality when they don't want it, like that's not invading privacy. Like uh, subpoenaing, finding out if Clarence Thomas or Judge Bork rents pornographic video films as though that's not an invasion of privacy. These people are hypocrites and uh, anyway. If I were an activist on campus today, I would demand that the administration test every entering freshman, and maybe test the class every year. So I would know what the risks are. Instead, you all, I mean, you have a choice. You can, you can put on a condom, you can be celibate, you can be monogamous, or you can take your chances. But it's all in the dark. You have to ask yourselves, why am I being kept in the dark? What is it, all this baloney they're giving me about AIDS education? I mean, that's the big thing. I remember, when, I mean, the, the reason that the uh, activists left, and I, 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 tell, I was at this story at the beginning, it is the left that has dominated the whole fight against AIDS. The reason they seized on education is because it didn't require any scrutiny of their <coughs> lifestyle as testing would. How many people in this room have ever seen in print in their, whatever the paper is for this town or for <coughs> Cleveland, big papers, or on their TV screen, screen the words promiscuous anal sex? Or in the, go into your uh, health clinic and ask for the uh, AIDS pamphlet and see if they use the words promiscuous anal sex, because that's what causes AIDS sexually. I interviewed the CDC uh, guy and uh, because I was curious, you know, how many people get it by anal sex as opposed to oral sex. He said that 99%, and he felt that it was statistically it was 100% of gay males get AIDS through anal sex. That's quite significant. Do you know that as many women contract AIDS heterosexually as men have breast cancer? Now, that means that, that that's a true statement. That means that there's a risk, but you know, Think, think, I mean, they can panic the whole country. And then, of course, people don't see their heterosexual friends, and particularly their married friends, dropping like flies. I mean, this is, a, and so they get the idea that there's no danger, and there probably is some danger, but oughtn't you to have, don't you have a right to know what it is? I mean, Will Chamberlain just yesterday said, uh, the day before, he's had 20,000 women in his lifetime. Well, I mean, even if he's a big liar, say it was 10,000. <laughs> <laughs> it's not so easy to get AIDS heterosexually, evidently. Right, my son is a rock musician, and he, I mean, he doesn't, you know, he doesn't read the books I read. He says that, uh, he says, of course, it's, uh, it's homosexual sex. He said, otherwise, the rock community would be decimated. <laughs> <laughs> you know, but it, it only, it happens to be hairdressers and designers. I mean, if the arts community is wiped out, but not the rock community now, that, that's, anyway. But why, I mean, why do we have to deal this way? Why, why, every politician is lying, practically. I mean, there are a few. Every government official on this issue. Anyway, I mean, I, 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 I mean, it, to me, it, you know, it, I, I, I love Magic Johnson. I'm, you know, it's tragic that he would contract AIDS. And he did say, you know, he's going to preach safe sex and that everybody get tested. Well, take it and run with it. Everybody should be tested. That is the prudent thing to do now, particularly everybody at risk. So you think this will raise an awareness of at least this testing as far as Magic Johnson is concerned? Because now I was. I mean, you're watching NFL yesterday, and you know there's a lot of players now. This is brought out, you know, in football. Mm. You know, it's a violent game, and blood gets on you, and people, yes. a lot of the players. Very were, dangerous. One of the players, I think, was about the Browns or somebody, mm -hmm. wrote an article this week, and they, and the media jumped on it. I mean, that, I mean, he, he was scared. He goes, there should be mandatory testing. There's a, well, I asked this, uh, again, the CDC official was an epidemiologist and an immunologist, and had been in charge of the Center for Disease Control's battle against hepatitis B. And, I said to him, do you, do, you know, how do you fight an epidemic? And he said, there is only one way to fight any epidemic, and that is you identify the carriers and you identify um, the people in their path. And you, do, you try to separate them. He said, how you separate them is, you know, uh, 
a whole, it's a political question, but you, you know, at the very least you can separate them by, it, you know, if they know, if you were to know, for example, if you were to know that in Ashland in the last five years, I mean, if we had regular testing and the rates were published and you saw an increase in the rates, that would be educational. <laughs> If you, if you had had to go in for an AIDS test, believe me, it will focus your mind on this problem very swiftly as you wait for the results of the test. You will find yourself thinking about AIDS in a whole different way. Um, but publishing the statistics also uh, would do it. But you will, what you will see in this, with the Magic Johnson thing, is that there will be the, the spin that they will give it is this, that anybody can get AIDS. So it's not just us homosexuals. Which it isn't, but it is homosexual sex. That is the primary, by like 90, whatever it is, percent, 95 percent cause. Yes, sir. Sir, I read your talk, you just made a fleeting mention of Hollywood. <clears throat> to what do you attribute the disproportionate numbers of Jane Fonders and Ed Asner's out there in Hollywood? Well, that could be a whole nother lecture. It's a, it's a degenerate place, is <laughs> it's one thing I would say. Um, you know, um, actors, I, I'll sum it up as I can. And the, the, the year I stopped being interested in the Academy Awards was when they gave it to Gandhi instead of E.T. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> there was uh, some, some wit said that the reason that Gandhi won was because Gandhi was everything that ha Hollywood wants to be, thin, moral, and tan. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, can't, I can't answer it in a, in, a, in a very serious way, but you know, there are people who make a lot of money. They, um, actors in Hollywood, you know, but just being an actor is a, is a certain kind of, I hope there are no actors for but no, they all recognize this is a certain personality disorder. In being an actor, and you inhabit, you want to fill up your persona, your personality with other people's personalities. They make a lot of money very quickly for reasons that they can't really understand. I mean, 90, there are 90,000 unemployed actors in Hollywood. I think 3% of the Screen Actors Guild works. So to be an actor in Hollywood is to wait on tables, basically. That's what they're all waitresses and waiters, and they drive those kind of uh, stretch limos that everybody likes to ride in in Hollywood. And then all of a sudden you get a job and you're making $50,000 a week. Well, it can you know, disorder your mentality. That's the way I would explain it. The arts community, I also have to say that art, the artistic community is always to the left. Part of being an artist is being a rebel and at war with society. Uh, Von Mises has written a very interesting uh, little book called The Anti-Capitalist Mentality. <coughs> which gives other explanations for it. Those of you who saw the film Impromptu, which was about George Sand and a bunch of artists at the turn of the 19th, beginning of the 19th century can see that their attitudes were very much like the attitudes of artists today. Anyway, it would be a whole other afternoon to, to answer your, it's a good question, but I can't do it justice yet. I'm interested in what was the turning point in your life to turn your life Well, I had, <coughs> in this book, no. <laughs> 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 I did, for those of you who are interested in the detail, I, I did an indestructive generation. But um, it was, one main thing or was, well, it was thing? yes and no, in that you always kind of have doubts. I mean, you're not totally unconscious when you're a radical, although it may seem that way to others. Um, and um, the end of the Vietnam War was um, distressing to me because most of what our opponents said would happen happened. And Everything that we said would happen didn't. And we had, we had allowed, the, helped the communists to win. They killed more people in three years than had been killed in 13 years of the anti-communist war. They made it into a, a national prison, which it is to this day. It has the largest or the fourth largest standing army in the world, even though it's terribly poor, uh, on and on and on. That, that was, and I also saw that uh, when the Vietnamese had a new tyranny, which was a communist tyranny, this compassionate left couldn't have cared less. And that taught me that the left is not about compassion. Your, your radical does not care about poor people, homeless people, black people, oppressed people, Vietnamese, Nicaraguans. They don't give a damn in the, in the, in the real sense of the word. They are, 
supporting these people in order to give themselves an excuse to bash America. They hate. They are full of resentment. If you ever get near them, uh, and that when you see them turn on you, you will know the true spirit that animates them, which is one of intense uh, resentment and hatred. But I mean, is that, is that the spirit that animated you when you were in America, or were you really? I well, you know, I didn't feel that way, but I see. I mean, I, you know, I I I never was in a kind of demonstration where they chanted, "Hey, hey, hey, LBJ, how many kids did you kill today?" But I, sure, I would have gone along with that. I remember chanting, um, you know, F-U-C-K Reagan in the middle of the streets in Berkeley with that. Although I was amazed that people were doing this and that we were getting away with it. You know? <laughs> <laughs> it was, it was uh, I think, you know, it's, it's a, I would have said to you, no, then. I would have, you know, and it would have been very sincere. I would have said, I am, a, you know, I'm an idealist and I believe passionately in this. But looking back at what excited me, uh, it was, you know, for that kind of confrontation, indicting, and, you know, people. And then when I look at um, America can do no right for these people. So that's the bottom line for them. I mean, I, I'm not here. I don't understand fully the psychology of it. But uh, I expected, um, well, I, you know, I, I, there were been many times, there were many times in my transition where I expected the left to approve of something that was done well. Look at, I mean, like, when they get up and say, uh, oh, I just was on a, a National Endowment for the Humanities panel, and they had a leftist project on Jim Crow and segregation. And the last segment was about, it was go from Reconstruction to the Civil Rights Revolution. And the whole section, and they wanted government money for this. And they may get government money. I, I, I waged a big battle against it, but they may get it. And it's the Duke University History Department is running it. Um, and the, the fifth section about the Civil Rights Revolution was called Persistence of the Past. Here they take the, the most profound, dramatic transformation, cultural transformation of any country that I am familiar with, and I've read an awful lot of history in the shortest possible time, and they only want to see the, the negative side of it. So I don't know. If, if somebody has a different explanation, of, to me, that means that the, 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 the core of their being is one of, of a, of a hate, you know, hatred of the father, the parent, whatever it is. I, I believe that leftism is an infantile disorder. Do <laughs> <laughs> you have any uh, comments on the rising divorce rate and where it's going and what's causing it? Or it I think it's all these things. I don't know. I'm divorced. I, um, you know, with all these things, I, uh, let, let me talk to something that's a little more than what I was saying in the talk, is the question of, of illegitimacy. Well, I had a friend when I was a kid whose parents were married eight years before he was, eight years, eight months before he was born. And uh, it was shocking to me when I heard, you know, that he was illegitimate. And I felt there was a great injustice in that, that he, you know, because he was my friend, he said, uh, and uh, I, why should he be stigmatized that way? And so, you know, I thought it was a great liberation to lift the stigma of illegitimacy. But now, I mean, now we have, uh, I, I forget the figures, but 40% of the poor are children without fathers. I mean, what a terrible thing that is compared to the other injustice. So, you know, I would have the same kind of uh, muddled reaction about, uh, about divorce. I think that uh, families, as we know, have, are terribly flawed. You know, all of our literature is about families going wrong and so forth, but it's the best way uh, to bring up children. I mean, you know, these other ways don't work, so. Um, I think, uh, I think it became, in my case, I know that there was so, there was absolutely no moral disapprobation. Of course, I was in Berkeley uh, for getting divorced. And I, I got really angry at that even though I was in the process of getting divorced. That nobody really said, you know, this is wrong. You've got to try to make this family work and so forth. And, uh, you know, my kids were grown at the time, but I think there's still a toll that everybody pays. I don't know. It's another kind of question for a whole afternoon. <laughs> I'd like to comment about um, books like Final Exit and things like that. About 
like like book of final exit. Do you think there is a relationship as far as this whole hatred concept in that basically there's been a lot of discussion about how the right to die is eventually going to turn into the duty to die? I I think I don't think that radicals pay much attention, the kind of radicals I'm talking about, to those kind of issues. I think it's very dangerous. I mean, I think if people want to kill themselves, you know, that's their business, I guess. But uh, I, I don't want to see the doctors. I mean, I'm against that movement, but I, it's not really an agenda of the left that I can see. It's the, I, there's no, you know, Molly Yard and uh, Benjamin Hooks haven't sort of formed a coalition to, on that subject, so I, I, I don't. There's a question. Is there, yeah, somebody else, go ahead. I had a wedlock. Um, where did you actually get this? From a book called, uh, this is not a blackboard, uh, Chain Reaction. Okay. This is a very interesting book by uh, Thomas Byrne Edsall. And it's about why the Democratic Party has lost its base. And it was in the chapter called Tax Revolt, I guess. But um, where are these statistics? Um, that, I mean, that's where I actually read that particular statistic, but I read them in a lot of places, and I'm just trying to. There have been a lot of books about, uh, about the underclass, and uh, it's, it's pretty well accepted now across a broad spectrum of liberal and conservative writers, and all the conservatives were the first to do the studies, that the primary cause of poverty in the inner cities is the, are these broken families and the whole, all the be path pathological behaviors that one sees in the inner cities. And the controversy is on the, the I, I can't call this man left, although he's a democratic socialist, because he's been so attacked and unfairly attacked by, uh, by the, the real radical crowd. But William Julius Wilson, who wrote a, a book called The Declining Significance of Race and another called The Truly Disadvantaged. His theory is that the, um, the black middle class, when the black middle class moved out of the inner city places like Harlem because of the civil rights revolution, they left behind, um, they left the people who were left behind without any role models. That's a, a basic idea. And the other idea is that the um, decline of the, uh, of the you know, Rust Belt type industries deprive the inner cities of, of jobs at a crucial moment. And I think that second factor, I mean, I'm not a sociologist, in it, but I, I agree with conservative uh, <coughs> sociologists who, who've argued that, that that is not the cause. Um, because you have all these immigrant groups coming in from Asia, which are very poor and don't have any, they don't even have language. And they take entry level jobs at McDonald's and so forth. And uh, just taking a bad job, I mean, this is one of the problems. If you take a bad job, you, you learn the discipline, you get in the chain, and you move up to the next job. My, my grandfather earned $3 a week, and they made him sleep under a sewing machine sometimes in the sewing factory. Um, and, uh, uh, but if you never get into the track, you never get anywhere. If you expect, and if you look at like rap music and so forth, I mean, what the, the image is to, to have the gold chains or the, the car, you can't wait, you can't get that when McDonald's. Um, but anyway, I'm not going to the whole thing. But you that's also said that uh, the left has brainwashed uh, the black community into welfare. Um, I, I, I assume that you were talking about uh, proportions because uh, more white people are on welfare. Than black yeah, people. no, I, I did, yes. Um, I, I, I don't know if I use the word brainwashed. Um, the, the left made several conquests in the 60s. One was the universities, but I, I believe the black political, political leadership uh, which has been shown to be way out of step anyway with the black community, like on the Clarence Thomas hearing, where three quarters of, uh, of black Americans supported Thomas, and of course the uh, black so-called civil rights leadership was almost unified in, in vilifying them. There was some, um, I forget the group that didn't go along with it, maybe Lowry's group. Uh, but th they brought in, like Jesse Jackson brought into a whole raft of radical ideologies. And I think it's just been much more destructive the black community um, just because they brought into it more. I don't know, you know 
You're right. I mean, those were four whites on welfare. And another last question. You also said uh, that. But of course, there are a hell of a lot more whites in the population, like four times. Yeah, I, I know that. I'm just. Yeah, go ahead. I, um, you said that uh, the Clarence Thomas bill was uh, you know, a liberal attack, and uh, you kind of inferred that Anita Baker was, I mean, Anita Hill was <laughs> in with that. And um, but isn't it true that Anita Hill is more of a conservative than even Clarence Thomas? You know, Thomas? there were so many stories that came out about that that I, I, um, I don't know what the answer is. I think that she, I think that the issue that brought her in was Roe v. Wade. I think that she is pro-abortion and he is anti-abortion, and that's what brought her in. I have no idea. Um, and I didn't, um, I, I don't understand Anita Hill's motivation. But she is a uh, But I don't think that Anita Hill, would, she wouldn't even be there if it weren't for these uh, radical groups that brought her in and trade her. So I, I didn't mean to imply necessarily that she shares their agenda. Let me just say one thing to that, cause, because he's suggesting that the reports have had her as a conservative. And while I think that may have been true of her when she was at the EEOC, at least first few years of the EEOC, fresh out of a uh, corporate law firm mm -hmm. and before that Yale Law School. Uh, since going to the University of Oklahoma Law School, I think there's evidence that I have seen in the public press that uh, she, she had, was moving to the left. Mm -hmm. I don't know how far to the left, but she was yeah. saying publicly in her school newspaper that she was troubled but, by Thomas' right. nomination but, because he was taking the country in a bad direction. Right, but she, she was lean enough to come forward. Right? Yeah, no, that was your point, and that's a yeah. very good point. She was lean enough to come forward. And these other people, their motivation was that there should not be a black off the plantation, that all blacks should think alike and they should all think like us. And to me, the most striking and dramatic uh, thing that happened in those hearings was that 100 million Americans were watching while a parade of very articulate black professionals representing all different points of view uh, were seen on, on, on screen. And that, they, in other words, the individuality of black Americans suddenly came to the fore, which, which the left was trying to express. Um, there, there are the whole group of black conservatives that are attacked and vilified as Uncle Tom's Roger Wilkins called Thomas Sowell probably, um, to my mind, the, the most important intellectual black figure in America today. Called him an enemy of his people because Sowell has written uh, articles showing that affirmative action does not work for black people or works against them. And Thomas Sowell is somebody who grew up in Harlem, poor in Harlem, has a scholarship to Harvard, and you know, he's, gone on. he's now at Stanford. That's S O W E L L for anyone. Anyway, I'll take one more question if there is one more. Otherwise, I've got to catch a plane back to sunny California. <laughs> All right, thank you all.